I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2022 Stephen D. Mastrovsky Lecture. I am James Willis, and I have the distinct pleasure of chairing the Department of Criminology, Law and Society. I wish I could see you all in person, but on the positive side, we get to meet and hear Professor Rachel Harmon, whom I will introduce in a moment. I wanna begin my fixed five or six minute allotment by thanking the organizers of this event, Cynthia Lam, Evan Lauder, the chair of the PhD Recruitment Committee, Suming Yang, Yasmin Irvin Erickson, and Devin Johnson. I'd also like to thank Alison Redlick, the graduate program director, and the department's associate chair, and Brielle Manovich, the graduate program coordinator. It really gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce this year's Mastrovsky lecturer, Professor Rachel Harmon. For those of you who might not be familiar with the Mastrovsky Lecture, the primary, the primary criterion for this particular honor is a distinguished record of academic achievement. But in this case, we can also add a distinguished record of public service. Professor Harmon is currently the Harrison Robertson Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law. And rather than read out her very impressive CV, I wanted to capture a bit of the spirit of the Mastrovsky Lecture in my introduction of Rachel with whom I spoke a week or so ago. As the director of the Administration of Justice Program, as our unit was first called, Stephen Mastrowski was committed to building a department where the work we do really matters, not only inside, but outside the walls of the university. And Steve has a PhD in political science. And as a police scholar, he was always mindful of the complex social, legal, and political environment within which police operate and the seriousness of protecting and advancing important public values, such as public safety, liberty, and accountability. Similarly, Steve has always been intellectually curious about the wide range of issues that shape policing, criminal justice more generally, and the possibilities of reform, and the importance of cross-disciplinary dialogues to advancing knowledge in these areas. And similar themes show up in Rachel's career, I think. Rachel told me she was always interested in public policy and justice issues, even though her undergraduate degree was in engineering, which I find extremely impressive. Right after graduation, she studied political sociology, as a link there, and political philosophy on a Marshall Scholarship at the London School of Economics, and then she enrolled at Yale Law School. It was here that she became interested in criminal law and legal practice. And after earning her law degree, she decided to go and work as a trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division criminal section of the US Department of Justice. I would just add that Steve also had a career in public service before switching to academe, enlisting in the Naval Reserve after graduating from high school, before being com commissioned as an ensign after college. Rachel told me she loved working in the world of actual practice, where she prosecuted a lot of cases, many involving the police. And serendipitously, this is when her attention turned to the promises and pitfalls of law enforcement. As she prosecuted offenders, she became more and more interested in how to prevent problems in policing from arising in the first place, and thinking about how the law could be used in more innovative and constructive ways for this purpose. And this led her to academe, where she is one of the very few scholars, I believe, who successfully bridges the very different worlds of law schools and criminology departments. I asked Rachel, given the nature of this lecture, which is also to act as part of our recruitment events, for any advice she might wish to pass on to future scholars or researchers. And she told me that it's important to take seriously the idea of adding to knowledge. Future scholars will be well served by giving themselves the freedom to explore things intellectually, even as they make strategic career decisions. She also gave me this analogy, which I really love. And then as I reflected on it this morning, it's actually an analogy that my dad would use sometimes who was a physics professor. She said, most academics are chewing on a bone but they chew on it in a lot of different ways. And when you start out, you don't necessarily know, need to know what that bone is. I like to think in the multidisciplinary environment of our department with sociologists, political scientists, psychologists, and criminologists, there is lots of chewing going on, on a lot of different bones. And this gives students lots of opportunities to figure out what they want to chew on in their own professional careers. I'll close my opening remarks by sharing Rachel's hope for the next generation of criminal justice and legal scholars, namely working together and combining their different areas of expertise and talents to answer a broad range of questions that are relevant to the police. 
which crime strategies are most effective, of course, but also how do police actions affect the community? What are the implications of what the police do for individual liberties? What are some of the other costs of police actions, even if they are lawful? These big questions suggest the need for meaningful collaborations from different perspectives, similar to the recent National Academies of Sciences Committee on Proactive Policing, which was chaired by our own David Weisberg and on which Rachel recently served along with uh, university professor Cynthia Lum. So I'm gonna now transition to Rachel in one second. I just wanted to say in terms of some housekeeping issues, um, please put your questions in the Q&A and not the chat. And Cynthia Lum will be moderating that after Rachel's lecture. And also Rachel does get a reward for giving us her, her lecture, uh, which is gonna be a handsome plaque uh, that she should receive. Um, so on that note, it gives me truly great pleasure to introduce this year's Mastrovsky Lecture by Professor Rachel Harmon. Thanks so much. Um, that was a generous introduction and I really appreciate the department, especially, especially Cynthia Lum for inviting me today. It's really a special privilege to give a talk in Steve's honor. When I left practice for academia, my goal was to figure out how law influences and could influence policing. But to get there, I needed not only law, but to understand police organizations and efforts to reform them. And in that vein, I relied enormously on Steve Mastrovsky's work. So you can imagine, I was pretty much starstruck when years later I got to work with him on a National Academies Committee. And that's when I discovered he's as lovely as he is brilliant. I hope I can do him justice today. I don't have to tell you that we're in a moment of crisis in policing, one that's causing many to rethink the policing project. Some are seeking to shrink the scope of what police do, for example, by turning over some mental health crises or problems arising from homelessness to non-police responders. Others are focused on making what police do do less violent and unfair, but for example, by training officers to de-escalate or requiring them to intervene to stop excessive force by another officer. As valuable as these efforts are, I don't wanna talk about any of that today. Quite the reverse. I think these efforts are going to help change policing, but after we shift some jobs to other actors and make what's left less violent and unfair, I think most of us would agree that something important will remain, that there is some core project, of course, of policing that officers will still be called on to perform. In the time I have today, I want to use the law to help consider the nature of that project. Along the way, I'm gonna to try to make three points. First, I think we misunderstand coercive policing. Just as atoms are the basic unit of matter, I'm gonna to try to persuade you today that enforceable commands are the basic unit of policing. Second, despite this, commands are little studied by academics and they're only poorly and indirectly regulated by law and policy. And lastly, our failure to regulate police commands properly makes the public less free and policing more violent. But once we see the problem, there's some natural steps for reform. So let's start with a question I've long asked myself. What is course of policing really all about? Now, one natural way to approach the nature of policing is to look at what police officers do. If you recall the children's book, What Do People Do All Day?, which followed the exploits of Grocer Cat, Mayor Fox, and Dr. Lyon, you will understand why I call this the Richard Scarry approach to policing. In the book, Sergeant Murphy saved Huckle from drowning in a fountain, stopped two bad boys from fighting, unscrambled a traffic jam, chased Wild Bill Hiccup for speeding, and took Gorilla Bananas to jail for stealing at the grocery store, all before going home for dinner. In some ways, Scary was not that far off. Contemporary patrol officers do maintain order, provide service, control traffic, investigate crimes, and so on. And clearly, we can learn a lot about policing by considering what officers actually do. But I don't think that analysis helps us hone in on the nature of policing. After all, many think that saving Huckle and issuing a ticket to Wild Bill Hiccup could be better done by actors other than the police. If what the police should do is heavily contested, then I don't think we can use what they currently do to describe the core of the project. Now, 
criminologists have always gone beyond the Richard Scarry approach. Most famously, Egon Bittner sought to describe the core of the police role by identifying the distinctive power that police bring to their tasks. For him, that was the authority and capacity to use force. Although Bittner recognized that police officers rarely actually use force, he nevertheless believed that what defines policing is that they show up with the power to use force wherever they go. Bittner's work and his influence are extraordinary. I don't think anyone has been more insightful about policing than he was. But as a lawyer, I've come to think there's something unsatisfying about treating the capacity to use force as the essence of the police project. Legally speaking, the idea that police show up with the authority to use force is simply wrong. When officers patrol the street or answer a call or discover a crime, they do have a toolkit of powers. They can execute warrants, for example, and they can conduct some stops, arrests, and searches without them. But at least in the first instance, force is not a part of that toolkit. They're not allowed to throw a trespasser to the ground or shoot a kid who just grabbed an iPhone from a senior citizen or pepper spray someone with an open bottle of alcohol. Instead, under both state law and federal constitutional law, officers are allowed to use force if and only if things go awry. That is, if a suspect refuses or resists or flees or threatens. If a suspect cooperates or if his resistance is feeble, he may be arrested, but he may not be subject to lawful force. This is not some newfangled restriction on police authority. It's been true for hundreds of years. At common law, an officer could not break down your door to execute a search warrant unless he first demanded entry and was denied. And he couldn't use deadly force against a fleeing felon unless the suspect refused to submit to arrest. In fact, if you compare police forces and military forces who are also authorized to use force in their work, you could even say that Bittner got it exactly backward. It's not the capacity to use force that defines policing. What defines policing is actually that they show up without the authority to use force. When soldiers hit the battlefield, wartime rules of engagement permit them to open fire on all enemy targets, whether or not those targets represent any immediate threat. By contrast, Police officers may only open fire in the face of actual resistance or to defend themselves or members of the public against manifest threats of harm. Defiance is now, and it has always been, a necessary condition for lawful force by a police officer. No defiance, no authority to use force. So force might be important to the policing project, but it's not the core capacity that officers bring to their tasks. If force is permissible only when officers are thwarted in conducting their lawful duties, and those lawful duties mostly involve searches and seizures, then you could answer our question about the nature of policing another way. Maybe policing is made up of the authority to conduct those searches and seizures. This is the answer that most lawyers would get. It's not crazy. Quite literally, we define police officers by their straight state law of power to make arrests. And even recognizing that most of what police do isn't criminal law enforcement, it isn't motivated by the desire to enforce the law, but instead it's about preventing crime or preserving order, providing service. A lawyer might still say, whatever the police are trying to do, when they show up, what they bring to their job is the power to stop, to arrest, and to search, at least when appropriate circumstances exist. This might be closer to the truth, but I'm still not fully satisfied. And I wanna explain my problem. The legal terms that we use to give officers their power, words like stop, arrest, and search, they don't really describe coercive policing all that well. To paraphrase, paraphrase Inigo Montoya, those words don't mean what we think they mean. So under the law, an arrest can be tackling someone to restrain them, or it could be a traffic stop that lasts too long, or it could be handcuffing a suspect and tra transporting him to the station house. Don't even get me started on what constitutes a search. 
Did you know that under constitutional law, a police officer who gets six days of records indicating your location from your cell phone company does not search you? But if it gets, but if an officer gets seven days of records, he does. When police look in your garbage, that's not a search. But if they walk a drug dog up to your front door, that is. Inside the law, these rules make some sense because effectively these legal categories are conceptual circles that we draw around groups of police activities. And we do that usually for the purpose of deciding what justifications officers must have before they do them or what they can do during them. But the legal categories actually hide what's happening in the world. So we say, for example, that an officer pulled someone over or searched someone, and it sounds like we're talking about a simple, well-delineated act that an officer conducts. But really, these are complex interactions, and they include acts by the officer and by members of the public. Look at an officer who's engaging in a custodial arrest, for example, and what you see is an officer issuing a chain of instructions with which the suspect complies. Turn around, put your hands behind your back, get into the car. So we say an officer arrested a suspect, but most of the time, what we really mean is that the officer told the suspect what to do and aided by the officer's guiding hand, the suspect arrested himself. I am not saying these legal categories aren't important. They structure a lot about policing and the institutional arrangements and incentives that officers face. But we can't tell much about coercive policing from that. So perhaps rather than focus on the legal categories we use to characterize sets of police activities, we should look at those activities themselves, what officers are actually doing when they exercise their authority to stop, arrest, or search people. When you break down coercive policing, just like I did with the arrest I described, what you see is a series of authoritative requests by officers. They demand action or inaction or information, and they invoke the officer's status as a law enforcement officer as a decisive reason why people should comply. Or to say that in another less abstract way, what coercive policing is made of almost exclusively is commands. Stop right there, license and registration, show me your hands, turn out your pockets, open the door. There are a few course of activities that police officers carry out that officers cannot execute by a combination of instructions and actions by the suspect himself. So if you think about a frisk, patting down someone's outer clothes to determine whether they have a weapon or looking in a trunk once it's open, what, those are coercive activities that don't follow this pattern. The exceptions, though, have all have the same character. The police officer needs information that the suspect cannot credibly provide, so the officer has to do it himself. Absent that, though, coercive policing can be, and usually is, self-executed after police commands. And only if that fails does policing usually become violent. People often say that police are special because they need not tolerate resistance. But Bittner talked about them not having to brook opposition. But I think we can turn that around. Policing is not about lawfully overcoming resistance. It's actually about communicating the demands that make resistance unlawful. Other actors, legal actors, also issue authoritative commands, right? Judges issue judgments. Those order people to prison. And legislatures pass criminal laws, which make us subject to criminal penalties. But policing is special. Officers issue their commands, and in real time, they impose immediate consequences on those who fail to comply. They issue the commands, they enforce them. That's different. Now, if commands are the basic unit of policing, as I suggest, they might be worth considering in some depth. And yet, neither criminologists nor legal scholars have studied them very much. Criminologists usually describe commands either as informal exercises of authority, distinguishable from formal invocations of the law, like arrests, 
David Klinger's work illustrates this approach. Or they view commands as part of the force continuum, which runs from a strong tone of voice on one end of the spectrum through commands to a bullet on the other end. William Terrell treats commands this way. Both take these approaches in order to help quantify police conduct. Okay, so commands are kind of incidental to the project. But I worry that these approaches are kind of misguided because when researchers treat commands as force, they do it because they want to consider threats of force alongside physical force. And they think that commands threaten force. There's something to this. Drop the gun carries the implicit threat or I'll shoot. But when an officer tells you to tell him your name or to shut up or to move away from the curb or step over to him, the implicit threat, if you don't comply, it's that the officer will detain you or he'll cite you or he'll arrest you or he'll charge you with a crime, not that he'll hurt you. As we've already said, force is usually a last resort. I think it's fair to say that commands are a conceptual precondition for most uses of force rather than a way to threaten. Nor do I think commands are an informal exercise of authority. The idea I take it is that a command, unlike an arrest, doesn't trigger a permanent criminal record or immediate physical consequences. So what we, when officers use them, we can think of it as an informal use of discretion. But that's like saying a criminal statute is informal because you haven't been prosecuted for violating it yet. When an officer tells you, put your hands against the wall, he's like a legislature passing a new law. Until that moment, you had no obligation to put your hands against the wall. When he tells you to do so, he creates a new legal duty for you. Effectively, police make law when they issue commands. And if you fail to comply, police will enforce that law. Just like when you violate a criminal law, you could be subject to arrest and to punishment. If you don't think criminal statutes are informal, then you probably shouldn't say that police commands are either. Um, these considerations of commands, as I mentioned, are mostly incidental. They're buried in articles that are devoted to studying what really matters, such as force or arrests, which raises the question, why don't criminologists study commands more or understand them better? The better question is why would they? Unlike an arrest or a use of force or discretion or many other subjects that criminologists study, commands have not been recognized as an important policing phenomenon. Not just by outside researchers, but by officers and poli police departments themselves. Officers receive almost no training about police commands and departments have no command policies. Whatever officers understand about commands, they largely intuit from practice and informal advice or from policies and training on other subjects like conducting stops and arrests that include incidentally some implicit advice about commands. You shouldn't be surprised that there's so little training and policy on commands either because training and policy, they follow law and the law only weakly and indirectly governs commands which is also why legal scholars don't notice commands much either. Now, it is not that there is no law governing commands, but despite the serious implications of commands, that law is relatively unclear and it's inadequate to regulate contemporary policing practice. Let me try to show you why. Let's start with the most basic question. Where do officers get the power to issue commands? You might think it's from state laws that make it a crime to fail to follow a lawful order, but that probably isn't right. First of all, those crimes look more like remedies for um, doing something that, uh, uh, that officers already have the power to do rather than grants of authority. But even if you don't think that's true, these statutes are a lot narrower than you might expect. In most states, lawful order statutes apply only in the traffic context. And there's a reason for that. There's a 1965 Supreme Court case that suggested that broader lawful order crimes are unconstitutional because they give police too much unconstrained power. 
that case has been forgotten some over time. And so some state laws don't apparently limit lawful order crimes to the traffic context. But broadly construed, those crimes might well be unconstitutional. Even if you weren't focused on how narrow these statutes are, you might care that some states, including Virginia, don't have them. They don't make it a crime to fail to follow a lawful order. Sure, you could be prosecuted for resisting arrest or for obstructing justice, but not for failing to follow a lawful order. And no one seems to think that officers have less power to issue commands in Virginia as a result. So let me propose an alternative understanding of where the power to issue commands comes from. Under state law, police officers have broad responsibilities. They're supposed to prevent and detect crime, apprehend criminals, safeguard liberty and property, preserve the peace and enforce the law. But they actually, as I've already suggested, very limited powers. Mostly they have the authority to execute arrest and search warrants, to collect and present criminal evidence to courts, to make warrantless stops, arrests and searches under specified conditions, and to issue traffic tickets in lieu of arresting someone. There are limited contexts where police are given express authority to issue commands, like the power to disperse unlawful assemblies. But most of the time, if police have the power to issue commands, it must derive from these other powers. I have never seen any case law or academic work that considers how the power to command follows from the power to search or to arrest, though that has, has to be the way it works. So let me, me come up with a tentative explanation. I think you can think about it this way. Remember that police usually use force only secondarily. That's if you're non-compliant. The fundamental reason for that is that our legal system is broadly committed to what we call the self-application of law. We almost always give individuals an opportunity to comply with legal requirements rather than physically compel them to do so. So if you lose a lawsuit, you're given a chance to write a check to pay for the damages before the bailiff uh, turns up at your home and takes your property. Officers are required to follow the same rule. They give you an opportunity to cooperate before they force you. This, for example, is why we have the knock and announce rule, which requires that even when an officer has a warrant to search your home, he has to knock, announce that he's the police, and be refused entry before he breaks down your door. There are exceptions. That's what a no-knock rate is. No-knock raids are dangerous. Amir Locke was killed in a pre-dawn raid just two weeks ago by Minneapolis police and Breonna Taylor before that. But it's not actually the total number of deaths associated with these raids that makes them problematic or alienates the public, though those deaths are important. They're actually relatively rare. Even when no one is killed though, these should spark controversy and concern in part because they violate this general principle that officers should give you a chance to cooperate before they force entry guns at the ready. And only when we really need, when we have really good reason not to do so, should they avoid that requirement. In order for us to have a chance to self-apply the law though, we have to know what the law expects of us. So, when we learn about what constitutes a crime, we do that from social norms and from the statutes. How do we learn about the legal duties that an officer generates? When an officer decides you should pull over or that you're under arrest, he has to tell you about it. And even though warrants are actually issued by courts, you have no way of knowing about the legal duties that in them, the, the, the ones that they create to open your home, for example, because only the government is present when a warrant is issued. So police officers have to tell you about the legal duties they create and about the legal duties generated by warrants that you have no access to. In this sense, commands are the way that officers inform us of our obligations when we have no other way to know. As long as we are committed to self-application of the law, 
and we allow officers to execute warrants and decide when to conduct stops and searches and arrests, then officers have to be able to issue commands so that they can inform us of our legal duties and give us a chance to comply. Without commands, all of policing would be like no-knock raids. Officers could throw you to the ground without telling you you're under arrest or pull you out of the car before letting you step out yourself. All right, if this account of the authority to command is right, that the power to issue commands stems from the power to conduct searches and arrests in a legal system committed to self-application of the law, then I think this account suggests three legal limits on the power to issue commands. First, commands have to be within the scope of the authority the police officers have under state law. Officers can't just issue any command they want. They can only issue a command if it's helping them achieve those, the activities that they're allowed to conduct. So put your hands behind your back during an arrest or open the trunk to allow a search. And since we police officers are permitted to take reasonable steps to protect themselves when they're doing these lawful activities, that would also include commands like show me your hands during a lawful stop. But that might not allow some other commands that officers sometimes give, like instructing someone to show his hands when the officer is not seizing him or orders to move on rather than to stay put. That's the first limit. They have to be within the scope of the officer's authority. The second is that even acting within this, the scope of state authority, officer commands have to comply with the same constitutional standards that regulate the activities that they're being used to accomplish. For example, since an officer needs reasonable suspicion to conduct a Terry stop, he should also need reasonable suspicion to shout, stop police. Though we don't usually think of it this way, constitutional law, and particularly Fourth Amendment law and First Amendment law that governs police activities also functions as a law of commands. And third, the third legal limit on commands that follows from my account is that commands that concern legal duties we can't otherwise know must provide us with clear notice and a meaningful opportunity to comply. Otherwise, they don't allow us to self-apply the law. This might not be, this wouldn't apply in like an active shooter situation in which the suspect has every reason to know that they're violating their legal duties by their actions. But when officers are conducting stops or searches or arrests that we don't know about until they announce them, then they need to give us an, this notice. And the notice and opportunity constraint actually has a lot of consequences for the way that uh, officers interact with citizens. Let me just mention one of them today. Clear notice is incompatible with ambiguous requests. And that's a very common practice in policing. Officers often don't make clear to members of the public whether they're inviting cooperation or providing an opportunity for people to self-execute the law before being forced to do so. If we're not told our legal duties though, then we're being denied due process. Right now, the law does not adequately enforce these constraints that I suggest follow from the, the, the uh, legal status and role of police commands. It does best with constitutional law. Courts do treat police commands to turn out your pockets or get out of the car, just as if they're the activities themselves. They just treat them the same. And they require that the commands, which they'll just describe as the activities, adhere to the Fourth Amendment. But officers, are, but excuse me, courts have done a terrible job enforcing or even articulating the other two requirements on commands, that they be within the scope of police authority and that they comply with minimum standards of due process. Why? Why do they fail so badly? Well, mostly because of how commands get challenged. Because constitutional constraints on commands can be tested when defendants bring motions to suppress evidence in criminal cases, that happens a lot. And it's led to a pretty well-developed law of commands, even if courts don't usually frame it that way. By contrast, people usually have no way to get into court 
to argue that a police command was outside the scope of the officer's authority. So an officer orders you to go home. And the only way you're going to be able to challenge that order is if first you refuse. Then he arrests you under a law for that refusal. Then the prosecutor maintains that charge against you. And then you go to trial, arguing that you haven't committed the crime of refusing a lawful order because the order was unlawful. You know how often all that happens? Almost never, which is why there are actually very few cases in state court on what, and so in the state, in the law, all the way back on what constitutes a lawful order. Much more commonly, what happens is when officers give questionable commands, people just comply rather than take the risk. Or if they are arrested, they're arrested for a different crime, like walking in the roadway or the prosecutor drops the charges, or the person pleads out rather than risks trial. Similarly, courts only rarely consider whether commands are given in a manner sufficient to give us notice and an opportunity to comply, usually only in the First Amendment context. So in sum, because it's difficult to challenge commands, the law governing them is not well developed. And as a result, we haven't realized the important role that they play. Importantly, because we have an adequate law and policy on commands, we're all less free. When officers give commands that are outside their authority or they make ambiguous requests, sometimes in a legitimate effort to be polite, people often wind up feeling mistreated and distrustful. And yet to refuse is to risk violence. So they self-check, not because the law requires them to do so, but because they don't know whether it requires to do, them to do so or not. The public is told, comply now and complain later. The National Police Association actually put out a video last year with that title, arguing that violence could be avoided if only members of the public complied more often with the commands of the police. But the public is being sold a bill of goods. Because while members of the public risk violence if they fail to comply, there is usually no avenue to complain later if they do. There is no law or policy against which the officer's actions can be measured. All right, how can we improve this situation? Of course, we could use more research on how commands are used and what consequences they have. I hope criminologists, maybe law professors, will do that. But departments here are the key. Departments could develop policies that promote clearer, better, and more lawful orders, starting with the principles I've articulated. All commands must be authorized. Commands should not ask citizens to infringe on their own constitutional rights. And commands to the public should provide clear notice about legal duties and an opportunity to comply, which in turn requires that officers clarify situations and communicate whether they're inviting cooperation or commanding compliance. I think these policies are important for their own sake. I genuinely believe that in a liberal de democracy, no one should have to be uncertain about their legal relationship to government actors. But I hope that this kind of policy could also have practical benefits. With a departmental policy, the public would be able to understand better the standards that govern commands. And such policies would provide a basis for holding officers accountable when they don't meet those standards. Having those policies in place could reduce conflicts between members of the public and the police, and they could provide a much stronger argument for complying now and complaining later because they would provide an, a venue for doing so. If you've never watched the video of Sandra Bland's arrest by a Texas trooper in July, 2015, I really encourage you to do so. Trooper Brian Insenia stopped Bland for a minor traffic offense, and he was unhappy with her apparent discontentment over the stop. So when the stop really should have been over, he asked Bland to put out her cigarette. There was no clear authority for that command. And perhaps for that reason, he gave the instruction in a way that made it impossible to know for sure if it was a, meant as a request or a command. When Bland questioned why she should put out her cigarette, the officer, again, perhaps uncertain about the legal status of the command he just gave, gives her another. He tells her to get out of the car. 
This, he seemed to think, put him on safer ground because it's really common and often permissible for officers to order people out of cars during traffic stops. In this case, he was wrong. Under the circumstances, that command actually violated constitutional law. On the video, you hear Sandra Bland repeatedly after this point insist that she has no legal duty to get out of the car. And the officer repeatedly insists that he's giving her a lawful order. The officer keeps us escalating, threatening to pull the, her from the car and to tase her. And the two end up in a serious conflict. The immediate incident finished with a violent arrest, but the incident ended even more tragically several days later when Sandra Bland killed herself in jail. I'm telling this story because the officer was fired later. And though the incident reveals many aspects of the command problem, I wanna highlight the reasons the department fired the officer. They noted in the letter firing him that he failed to remain courteous and tactful and that he failed to exercise patience and discretion, that he extended the stop inappropriately and that he didn't go through the department's stop script properly. The department did not complain about either the scope or the manner of the officer's commands. Though they violated all of the legal rules I've articulated, they exceeded his authority, they violated constitutional law, and they failed to give her a fair notice of her duties. Of course, the department did focus on these problems with his conduct because it had no policy making those standards clear. Now, the next officer might not show such bad judgment, but he would be no better informed about the limits on police command. If state legislatures and courts did more to clarify the ground, then departments would be more inclined to act. After all, departments often write policies in response to the law. But even now, departments should realize that clarifying commands can build trust and reduce harm. Now, you might think that the problem of commands isn't that bad in the scope of problems in policing. Let me make one final pitch. I think there are two trends in policing today and in the reform of policing today that might push police officers towards more problematic command practices in the future. First, as I mentioned, communities are seeking to take away from police responsibility uh, responding to car accidents or mental health crises, public order conflicts over things like homelessness. This push is likely to mean that a higher proportion of the calls that officers do take are likely to require officers to exercise some kind of coercive authority. So coercion is gonna be a higher proportion of what police do. At the same time, communities are worried about the harms and unfair distribution of stops, arrests, and more recently, home entries. And therefore they're pressuring police to address public safety and public order concerns without doing so many of these intrusive actions. Well, how are police gonna manage situations coercively with fewer stops, arrests, and searches? Probably they're going to issue more and perhaps more questionable commands. Today, we can take the first step towards avoiding that outcome. All I'm asking you to do is to take seriously the centrality of police commands in course of policing. And then I think we can go from there. I wanna thank everyone again for having me today. I really look forward to your questions and your thoughts. Thank you, Professor Harmon. Uh, wow, I, as, as you were speaking, I was thinking back just to my own policing days and thinking about all the times in which there was so much ambiguity about the communication interaction between an officer and a person, you know, and um, your, your lecture brings up so much thinking around just the ambiguities about discretion, communication, interaction, compliance, and action um, that, that I think the police departments, because some of your suggestions are really focused on policy changes in police departments. I think this would be a huge um, uh, undertaking for them to really correct, just given the amount of 
lack of um, understanding about the three legal limits that you're talking about and how that's even talked about in training, in supervision, in just everyday interactions between officers and, and people. Um, I just find this fascinating, Rachel. Thank you so much for your thoughts. I have a number of questions myself, but I wanna to get to some of the questions that the audience is posing. Um, and then I'll maybe come back and ask what you think about, you know, the realities of changing police behavior in this particular area of command. Um, but the first question was raised by George Faulkner and he asks uh, about both Graham v. Connor and Terry v. Ohio. And he would like to know your opinion on the influence of Graham v. Connor and Terry uh, versus Ohio on police policy, training, tactics, and culture, and whether those provide proper legal parameters for the use of force. Do you feel that they're, they are overly ambig ambiguous? Do you think too permissive or just right? Um, so that gets me a little bit off the topic for today, but I, it I, think, it's, I think it's fair to say that Graham v. Connor um, contributes to the ambiguity of the relationship between commands and force because it gives so little guidance um, to police officers about when force is legitimately used. It doesn't uh, clarify what purposes force can be used for, what circumstances it can be used under. It is, it, it is ambiguous about the timing of force compared to the non-compliance that officers face. And it even is ambiguous about the role of non-compliance. So I actually think that Graham v. Connor is critical here in, in leaving this area as ambiguous as it is. Terry v. Ohio is a little bit different. I, you know, the reason why people are concerned about Terry is because it authorizes uh, or it permits states to authorize so broadly the stops that often are the low level and ambiguous interactions between members of the public and officers. Um, I'm not sure that, that uh, uh, the problems with Terry, um, which really uh, come to um, fruition in proactive policing strategies, um, can be attributed all to the opinion itself. I think we've used it as the backbone for practices that we could regulate in other ways. But I do think that it too, by allowing such low level interactions that are coercive, might create ambiguity in this context, sure. Do you think that there are, just to follow up on that, do you think that there are different classifications of commands between proactive policing and um, more reactive approaches? Uh, yeah, I think there might be. I, I think we need to do more work um, to identify the kinds of commands that officers are using and the situations in which they're using them to actually figure out what, why do officers need commands, and then it, it, to the degree they do, how can we make sure that they are authorized? Like, I, you know, I don't presume that officers never need commands, but I do presume that the terms in which they need them should be clear, that their authority to use them should be unambiguous, and that members of the public should have access to information about the scope of that authority and whether their a command creates a legal duty for them or not. So it's, it, you could disagree about the scope of police commands and still agree that the principles should be Clear. You know, you raise the question of how realistic this is, but I think you could take small steps towards this end immediately and still improve the terms of contemporary policing. Just the clarification of uh, commands between officers, with, uh, amongst officers and amongst citizens, would be a huge step forward because I yeah. think there is a lot of ambiguity and. Um, uh, uh, lack of understanding of what would constitute a legal command. Yeah, I think officers often don't know whether they have the power to issue a particular right. command or not. That's crazy. We send them into the onto the streets in circumstances in which they could face resistance and noncompliance with with vague instructions about what they're allowed to do. That's not okay. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from James, uh, Professor Willis, who would like to know just a little bit more about the 
origins of what you're suggesting today in terms of the analysis of police commands. How did, what led you to see that as like a, your aha moment of thinking about that's really important? That's interesting. I, you know, I have actually been focused on this. It, it's, this is a project that's been years in the making because it bothered me for a long time um, that I didn't, that when I looked at a police command, I couldn't tell if it was a lawful command or not. So it would come up in uses of force. It was really in analyzing uses of force situations where I would start tracking backwards and saying, what happened here? Um, and I'd look at the non-compliance and then I'd look at what generated the non-compliance. And I think, well, they clearly disagree. Now, sometimes members of the public don't know, but they are required to do something. But when I started to think about it, I thought, well, how would they, how would they know what they're required to do? And mm -hmm. how would the officer know? And when I started to think about that, I was actually horrified because the idea that we, we cannot know, that lawyers can't know, that officers can't know, and that members of the public can't know, strikes me as really disturbing. So I started to think about the role that commands were playing. And I, I've tried to come at this project in several different ways. I thought about uh, the, the breaking down, you know, creating a model of police citizen interactions. I actually have that in my book, uh, The Law of the Police. I, I, I kept trying to come at it in different ways. Um, but, uh, and this is my, I guess, my latest attempt. It's been, it's been years in the making. And then the crises in the world had me turn away from this project to focus on the use of force and other uh, efforts on, to reform the law of the police. Um, but now I'm back. I think this is uh, fundamental to the project of course of policing. And, and I think it needs um, work that we haven't yet done. You know, one of the things that you mentioned in your talk was um, just about the, the detail that you provided about an interaction back and forth between an officer. The Brianna Taylor incident is, uh, of course, one of the most famous ones, but this happens all the time, right? How do you actually, um, and, and maybe this is appropriate for the Mastrovsky lecture uh, because of Steve's work on systematic observation, but I can only imagine that to study this would require um, observation of things that never get reported, that, uh, you know, never make it into a case or a serious event, because this is happening all the time, right? Have you given some thought about how a social scientist would study this? You know, I'm going to leave that to the social scientists, because I'm the beneficiary of social science work, though I, I try to support it in any way I can. But I, what I would say about that is we are in a totally different position than we were even 10 years ago with regard to this problem, which is when we did this 10 years ago or longer, we just couldn't know what was going on and we couldn't see, but yeah. now we can see. And I think police video, and as we get better at uh, um, um, machine learning analysis of those videos so that they become data and not just anecdote, I think we're going to get better and better at analyzing these kinds of situations. And perhaps both with systematic observation, even if it's in the form of video, and with uh, other kinds of analysis that we get better at over time, we can make some progress on what's going on in the world. Yeah, and getting, getting agencies to cooperate and work with us on, on taking a look at that video would be so key and helping them uh, to develop sharper commands. Um, Maddie McPherson, one of our students, asks, how do you reckon with the reality that officers employ commands and adjust their expectations for suspect compliance, subject compliance, depending on the race and ethnicity or other um, uh, categories of the suspect? Yeah, so I think it is a critical fact that we always have to keep in um, mind that when officers assess non compliance first of all, when they decide whether a command is required, that is the decision to generate a legal duty could be based on uh, implicit and explicit bias. Um, and then 
perceptions of non-compliance, I think are deeply, the, th those perceptions are going to be culturally specific. They can include biased decision-making. And, it, you know, there's, we don't have great ways to reduce those bias. I, I think we, we're starting to focus and, and develop strategies for doing so, but there's no perfect solution to the problems of bias and policing. I do think though, that if we clarify the terms of the encounters, then it can easily make officers more self-conscious about the decisions they're making and therefore uh, you know, rate, highlight when they might be imposing legal duties that are uh, excessive for the scenario or are tied to their perceptions of somebody's, uh, the, the, that somebody is scary or dangerous or, or criminal. Um, and so even though this won't solve the problem of bias, I think it might highlight the problem of bias in a way that will make people more self-conscious and maybe enable us to intervene to prevent it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel, for those comments. Um, Dr. Coper has a question about um, police agencies that you think might have or, or might show or have done some work in this area um, and who have developed policies or training uh, that guide officers' use of commands. Any thoughts about this? Any, any agencies that might be some that we could look towards? What would this look like? Uh, in terms of developing this this work? Um, I don't know of uh, agencies that have done this. What I will say is that um, the if you look at procedural justice training in agencies, which is obviously very popular, um, some procedural justice training actually makes this problem worse because it tells officers to do things like ask it as a request instead of issuing a command because it'll be perceived as more impolite, polite. And that actually creates more ambiguity about whether it's a legal requirement or not. But other procedural justice training, which emphasizes clarifying the, explaining and clarifying the relationship between officers and citizens, I actually think mitigates this problem. And so I think we should be scrutinizing training for that. And we should, we could easily incorporate more of it in the procedural justice training we're already doing if we were paying attention to this issue. Um, but I think that departments that are doing that kind of good procedural justice training are already in effect taking some in, in indirect steps towards these ends. Okay, Rachel, I have a final question. I have to give this because this comes from our constitutional lawyer who is on our faculty. <laughs> so I, I definitely cannot uh, ignore it, Professor Linda Marola. Um, she says that she believes a significant benefit of this approach is increasing transparency for the public when they're interacting with the police. And uh, she has had students that are concerned when they realize that officers can sometimes make, you know, quote, voluntary requests, such as for consent searches, that sound to members of the public like authoritative commands, right? And it seems that this would require some rethinking at the Supreme Court level of the importance of transparency and open communication when speaking with the public. It might require police to be more clear about, for example, what search warrant exception they are relying on at a traffic stop. Um, and, and however, the public would now be able to have more trust in what the officers tell them. Can you speak just a bit uh, as the last question about how the Supreme Court might need to rethink officers' duties, such as at traffic or at other stops when communicating with the public? Yeah, so this is a really important point that I didn't get into because I know it's mostly not a lawyer crowd, um, which is that the Fourth Amendment law actually um, uh, contributes to the problem by not requiring that officers uh, state requests as a request or tell people that they have a right to refuse consent, okay? and. Even if the court does not rethink that Fourth Amendment issue, I think as a matter of due process, it's not the failure to tell you that you have a right to refuse that matters. It's that unless we tell you you have a right to refuse, you won't know when you have an obligation to comply. And you have to have an, know that 
in order to satisfy the terms of due process. So I actually don't think we have to, I, I, it would be great if the court would revisit some of those rules, which I think have not always been helpful. But even if they don't, I actually think here, we're talking about the due process principles that govern police interactions with the public, not the Fourth Amendment principles. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Professor Harmon. I am. Uh, uh, I, I have so many more questions for you, but we've run out of time, uh, and so I'm going to turn this back over to Professor Willis. But I, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. I have gotten to know you and and learn about your work over the years, and it's been a privilege. Uh, and so I'm so glad that you were able to come and speak to us today for for our prestigious Mastrovsky lecture. So thank you so much, Professor Willis. I turn the uh, panel back over to you. Turn the Zoom or the webinar over, I guess. Uh, right. Well, yes, I'd like to echo those sentiments. And I, I think I'd close by saying, you know, Steve has always been a very big thinker. He likes big ideas and he, uh, he likes the complexities uh, that those ideas entail. And I feel like what you've done such a great job of today is sort of opening up a whole vista an area of research, you know, that, that it, uh, you know, really is compelling in many ways. Uh, and you've evoked many people that I admire, like Aegon Bittner. Uh, listening to you was a bit like reading Max Faber, you know, really fine-grained, thoughtful. I mean that as a big compliment, uh, you know. So thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, and thanks especially to Cynthia for, for moderating uh, the, the Q&A. So, um, uh, you know, I look forward to hearing more. Thank you for the opportunity.